Okay, I think we're actually live. Welcome uh, to June and Cindy and Tim and Anna Luis and Lorela. Um, excited to be here. Really happy to talk about transformation. Idea. Okay, good time. Good time. Uh, to June. And talk about power. Cindy and Tim to June. There's some background noise. And Tim and Anna Luis and Lorela. Delay. I think that might be on June's call. Okay. Um, so June Holly has graciously offered to join us today and to help facilitate the live stream. So she'll be the person those of you who are joining us live are interacting with. So I invite June just to say a word of introduction here and then we'll move on to the rest of the team. June, do you want to introduce yourself? You might have your other sound muted too. I'm still getting a lot of feedback, and I, I don't know, Anna Louise, if, if you should mute right now. I, I don't know if anybody else is, but I'm getting a lot of feedback. Just, you might have your other sound muted, too. I'm still getting a lot of feedback. Okay. Well, I think, uh, Gene, you might have the YouTube playing on your other screen, so there's a 20-second time lag. That's probably what you're hearing. But anyway, as, as June drops off screen, those of you who are joining live in the live chat will, will be interacting with June. Um, so we're going to jump into a conversation on power and post-oppositionality, which is uh, exciting for me, and I'm happy to be joined here by folks who've been doing this work for a long time. And before we do, just a, a bit of context on what these conversations are for folks who are joining for the first time. So uh, this series is what we're calling Conversations on Transformation. It's a chance to have um, a set of dialogues around how change happens at every level. We talk about I, we, and world. And today is a conversation on power and post-oppositionality, which we see cutting across all of those things. Uh, my name is Brian Stout. I'm a middle child, uh, husband, father of two little kids, uncle, uh, mediator, network weaver, and I'm a former US diplomat and I'm a, a lifelong connector. And I'm joining you all today from Ashland, Oregon, which is actually my birthplace on lands traditionally stewarded by the Shasta people. I'm helping shepherd an emergent collaborative called Building Belonging, which we envision as an online home for people who believe in building a world where everyone belongs. Easier said than done. Uh, you can find out more about us at buildingbelonging.us. Um, Today's conversation, to state the obvious, uh, it's two weeks after elections here in the US. Um, those elections are <laughs> over in some sense and not over in other senses. And I know we're joined by some people in different places around the world. Uh, COVID cases are spiking everywhere um, and it's, it's scary. So we are living through a moment that is both literally traumatic in lots of ways and also a vital time to be alive. So just wanna to honor that and for myself and everyone, before we dive in, um, just invite everyone to take three breaths together. I'll offer a couple prompts for, for folks who wanna um, join us in this. For the first breath, um, if we imagine this virtual space today as a house and you're walking into the house and taking your, your shoes off at the entryway, um, what is one thing you wanna leave behind as you enter our shared space? Something that's some tension you're carrying, like kids are screaming, dogs are barking. Um, let's just take a moment to, to put that aside for a second as we step in. For your second breath, um, invite folks to center in your intention. Um, what drew you here today? There are many things you could be doing with your time, um, especially those of you who are joining in, in evening hours. Um, why are you here? What do you want to, how do you want to show up for the next 80 minutes together? And then finally, for your third, just a, a shared moment um, to be with your cares and to be with each other, sort of feel out the other people in the room with you and uh, join in from around the world. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> At least I needed that. Um, so we're going to jump into it, and we want to start, as always, by um, getting to know each other. This is the first time this particular group of folks have been together, so we're getting to know each other, even as you all are getting to know us, too. Thank you. So, <laughs> the three that. prompts we offer are, uh, I am, 
my people are and I belong to. So the invitation is for folks to take up those prompts or deviate from them as you see fit. Uh, we'll start with Lorela and then move on to Anna Luis, Cindy, and Tim. Lorela, welcome. Thank you, Brian. It's great to be here. I am Lorela Luciana Preliangulo, and my PGP is she, her, ella. My people are, in the words of Ella Baker, those who believe that freedom cannot rest until it comes. And instead of I belong to, I'm going to do that I believe. Um, I believe that we can and that we will. I believe that we can and that we will win. Hello, I don't know why I always feel like I need to wave with Zoom. Uh, my name is Ana Louise Keating. I'm a, I'm a professor, um, a scholar, a teacher, an author, and a visionary pragmatist. I'm interested in making change by envisioning things differently. So I'm just gonna read you a quote and that's gonna be my people are and who I belong to. And this is a quote by Gloria Anzaldúa who probably is certainly who I belong to in many ways. And this is from an early essay she wrote and she's talking about El Mundo Zurdo, which is the left-handed world, the world for those of us who don't exactly fit anywhere. Um, here we go. The mixture of bloods and affinities rather than confusing or unbalancing me has forced me to achieve a kind of equilibrium. Both cultures deny me a place in their universe. Between them and among others, I build my own universe, El Mundo Zurdo. I belong to myself and not to any one people. The rational, the patriarchal, and the heterosexual have held sway and legal tender for too long. Third world women, lesbians, feminists, and feminist-oriented men of all colors are banding and bonding together to right that balance. Only together can we be a force. I see us as a network of kindred spirits, a kind of family. We are the queer groups, the people that don't belong anywhere, not in the dominant world, nor completely within our own respective cultures. Combined, we cover so many oppressions but the overwhelming oppression is the collective fact that we do not fit. And because we do not fit, we are a threat. Not all of us have the same oppressions, but we empathize and identify with each other's oppressions. We do not share the same ideology, nor do we derive similar solutions. Some of us are leftists, some of us practitioners of magic, some of us are both. But these different affinities are not opposed to each other. In El Mundo Zurdo, I with my own affinities and my people with theirs can live together and transform the planet. So I belong with everybody who's interested in making progressive transformation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy Suarez. And I could say a lot of things about where I am, but I think a short encapsulating, although limiting, obviously, cap, you know, word is or phrase is um, a theory head from the hood that says a lot about me. I grew up in black community in Roxbury and I've always been fascinated with theory and social change and, and practical change around me and my community. So both embedded and both really into theory. My people, my people are artists in Puerto Rico. I come from a family called the Ayala family and they are artists and they uphold the black strand of art in Puerto Rico. And so they're very um, big in my imagination. I grew up in a family where, there, where blackness was celebrated. Um, so that was, <laughs> that's my founding story. And it's, I, I know it's really different, but I often orient really different based on that. Um, and I belong to the future. Sometimes I feel like, where, where am I? How did I get here? <laughs> so I always feel really, you know, propelled towards a future that I see emerging in cracks, you know. Thank you. Lovely. Um, thank you. Um, so my name's Tim and I'm joining you from Australia, from Canberra, Australia. Um, and thank you to Brian for, for reaching out and inviting me um, to talk to you across the other side of the world. Um, I'm on the land of the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of this land. Um, this land has never been ceded um, and there's never been any treaty or exchange of sovereignty or anything over any of the um, first people's lands of this continent of Australia. Um, 
so I also, I guess, have an interesting relationship to the, to the kind of the settler colonialism of this um, continent, having um, arrived here myself, um, you know, as the, as the child of refugees and Holocaust survivors. Um, and yeah, there's a, I guess that, that's a, an interesting way into the question of who my people are and how I, how I belong on, on this land. I've been brought up with the, with the privilege that comes with being um, a settler colonialist in this land, um, but also with a very deep understanding of the way that privilege is, um, is very temporarily constructed and can be removed um, very quickly, remarkably quickly. Um, it, when and if circumstances change. Um, so as well as that, I'm a, I'm a musician, I'm an environmentalist, I'm a um, grassroots political activist, heavily involved in a whole range of things in my community. And um, like Cindy, kind of both, um, you know, both embedded in the community, but also embedded in theory. So I work a lot in terms of ecological political theory, social ecology, and, and the way we can construct our... Um, our politics and our social change around um, the methodology and the ideas of, of ecological interdependence and diversity. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Cheers. Thank you all. Yeah, I feel like uh, every time we have this prompt, I learn something new. And I'm also reminded of how much depth is still lurking behind what you all just said. So I hope and invite you as you uh, speak into the topics a bit more to feel free to share some of your current work and what it looks like. Um, I'm excited about what all of you are doing and hope you'll bring it into that conversation. So this conversation is about two topics which um, we, I think, see in relationship to each other but are both complicated and worth unpacking. So one is power, which we'll get into, and the other is post-oppositionality. It's a bit of a mouthful, as Anna Louise, I believe, will attest. Um, but it's also a beautiful concept, what it's trying to convey. And so the language really does matter there. And she's the one that introduced me to it um, via Gloria Anseldua. So we thought we would start there, um, ask Anna Louise to speak a little bit to what that term means, um, why it matters to you. And then we'll tip over into um, Lorela to talk a little bit about how you see that work, whether you resonate with that term specifically or the concept behind it, how that animates your work right now. And then we'll, uh, Try to bring in the lens of power with Cindy first and then with Kim. Why don't we start with Anna Louise? What is post oppositionality? Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have notes so that I'll keep on track and not just wander around because it's kind of a circular topic and it's easy to do that. So I want to acknowledge the term can be confusing and I want to acknowledge that labels are temporary and when they no longer serve a purpose, they should change. So I use the term to honor what I've learned from oppositional social justice thinking, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, Gloria Anzaldúa, although she's also very post-oppositional and so on. Um, and I came up with this term when I was working on my book, Transformation Now, and I started with the term non-oppositional. And as will unfold, I realized that term itself is oppositional because it's framing against, right? This is the question of how do we get out of the ways we think now so we can think differently and create something different because our language so much shapes things. So um, post-oppositionality is a relational approach to living, to thinking, and to enacting social change. It's premised on a foundation or what I call a metaphysics of radical interconnectedness. This, is, this posits that we are related to everything that exists, right? Everything and everyone, whether or not we see it. So it flies in the face of the hyper-individualism, the self-enclosed individualism that dominates the United States and so many Western cultures. Um, it's radical because I'm positing at the roots, whether we see it or not, at the roots, we're radically interrelated. And so that is kind of like, what shapes everything and has kind of like led me down this path. So even though, so, so see, this is actually a very ancient belief, right? This is indigenous philosophy. This is very ancient as well as, um, you know, we can see it even in complexity science. Um, so it's an old, old belief. So 
Post-oppositional doesn't mean that we don't use oppositional tactics, but it means we move through them and try to get somewhere else, right? Um, and in this way, those of you who know Chela Sandoval's work, it's similar to her understanding of oppositional consciousness or what she calls differential consciousness. It's the idea of like driving a stick shift car, not that I can do that, but I understand that you have gears, right? And you shift based on the terrain. We change tactics based on the terrain we're in. We just don't become locked into opposing, right? So it's... Um, it's, it's, it's trying to find different ways than us against them, me against you, me reacting against what I disagree with. Because if we react against something, we are still shaped by what we're reacting against. So we could think of some second wave feminist thinking that reacted against patriarchy. But in that reaction against, there's this way of reproducing it or being too shaped by that which is being reacted against. Um, so... So in my opinion, this is in part why transformation happens so slowly because we're locked into the status quo. So basically post-oppositionality is an invitation to think beyond that, to embrace contradiction um, and to just kind of question the status quo. How's that for a definition to start things off? Okay. That's beautiful. And there's a lot there. I'm seeing some uh, some resonance in the live chat as well. And uh, yeah, so much appreciation for the, the power of language here. So yeah, I think part of my attraction to this specific composition of folks in the call is that each of you is anchored in a different sort of um, praxis. So how you apply these theories and you're all um, simultaneously deep readers and learners and very curious and also curious in service of something, right? You're doing something. So the invitation for Lorela um, to take in whatever direction feels generative right now is, I see you doing this in your work, like you sort of embody post-oppositionality in a lot of ways. And I think it, I think about it in the context of the immigrant justice movement, but also bigger than that. So how do you see this applying to you and your work? What, what do you think this concept might do for us as we are seeking transformation? Hmm. You know, I think that the last two weeks, the sort of period where we are trying to, or many people are engaged in the in active interpretation of the elections, what it means, what failed, what worked, what didn't. And much of the sort of intra-democratic party fighting that we're seeing right now, that is quick to sort of launch the firing squad and try to assign blame, both to movements, to issues, to sort of centrist versus uh, left <laughs> um, is a perfect example of why we need to move into the world that you're describing, and Luis. Uh, that if we continue to understand ourselves and the world in this binary, in a binary, frankly, that truly only exists in the activist community to a degree. That I, you know, I believe ideology is important, but. People, A, do not live single issue lives. And when you are organizing, you know that. Uh, and also people don't necessarily have a concept of, like ordinary people don't have a concept of left or right. Uh, they want to be able to put food on the table. They want to move from uh, survival to thriving and um, a lot of, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying the conversation is not important. I'm, I'm saying the way in which we're carrying out the conversation is wrong. Uh, it is not creating an opening uh, or an invitation to the possibility of evolving. Uh, and we are, as humans, not static. We are not, we don't live in sort of a permanent way of being. Uh, and so I'm often... Uh, trying to understand, like, how do we engage with the world in a way that allows for people to evolve and that allows us to solve some of the biggest challenges and of our time? <clears throat> and the conversation that has taken root or shape in the last two weeks is a good example of how we are getting it wrong and how we need to actually practice what we preach uh, and there isn't anyone specific to blame. I think that movements have a right to defend themselves when all of a sudden, you know, elected officials or people in quote unquote power begin to say, well, you're the reason. 
even though you have mobilized the largest social movement in the history of this country, you're the reason we lost. I think it is their right to stand up for themselves, for their people, and for what they stand for. How do we do it in a way that allows us to bring about a different kind of future, right? Um, especially as we are, you know, just to sort of take the theory and, and turn it into practice, especially as we try to understand in the United States, what is this governing moment uh, that we're going to be walking into? And then maybe the last thing I will say, uh, Brian, is I was thinking about this talk earlier today, and um, I pulled out my biography of Frederick Douglass. This is one of my favorites. And, uh, and I had highlighted this piece that, you know, I always find myself like I live in this contradiction of both uh, feeling in my heart like I am and believe in abolition and abolition as a way to bring in sort of the new. Um, and at the same time, sort of this sense of radical pragmatism uh, that it is so important, you know, to deliver material change in people's lives. And I found this that resonated, um, which is that, you know, says he repeatedly faced the question of how uncompromising radicalism could mix with a learned pragmatism to try to influence real power, to determine how to condemn the princes and their loss, but also influence and eventually join them. And I find that so interesting because we often ask people to choose, right? We often spend a lot of energy asking people to choose, right? And Louise, I think you write about this, right? Are you with us or against us as opposed to uh, actually, how do we sit in the contradiction of both believing, you know, in sort of big vision, big, bold structural reform while also engaging with the world from this um, sort of radical pragmatism standpoint and feeling sort of the urgency of now uh, to deliver real and material change in people's lives. So I'll, you know, share that just at the top and I'm sure we'll come back to it. Mm, I love that. Thank you. Now I'm feeling myself already kind of softening into this conversation. I guess this is the space I want, I want to be in. These are the conversations that feel necessary. And thank you, Lorella, for bringing in uh, the ancestors. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, there's so much wisdom on the table. And I, I appreciate that pivot here. I think and maybe the transition you just offered to Cindy to take this question of power. Um, so Cindy, for those who don't know, wrote the book on it, uh, a book on it, and might be the book on it, uh, called The Power Manual. And for me, um, entering this, this relationship with power as a white man who holds various forms of privilege, um, certainly in the United States, uh, I found it so attractive and it was sort of puzzling to me that it was written by someone who just does not hold the same identities I do. And so I've been continuing to explore that. And every time I engage with Cindy and Cindy's work, um, I find myself provoked in a, in a different way. So the invitation here is, what is power? <laughs> uh, and, and how do you see it um, playing out in the context of post-oppositionality that Anna Louise and Lorela just described? Oh, yeah, thank you so much. My heart is so full just from listening to you guys. Like, I almost feel like it's about to burst. And I really pay attention to what my heart does. So I'm just kind of like a little bit like excited. Um, and I guess really touched because there's a truth to what you're saying. And I think for me, when I, so I come from like social justice space, growing up in the hood, being really into theory. And part of that theory was my spiritual practice. I have an Eastern-based spiritual practice meditating since I was a kid. And so in both those worlds, the main area of study is liberation. So I had those two contrasts, right? Like liberation, how we talk about it in social justice and how we talk about it in my spiritual space with a, um, with a realized being, like as someone who actually walks the earth, who practices that, like the idea of being evolved, being, being, a thing that's real, like there are people alive today who are, you know, evolved beings who are here. Um, this idea of mastery um, of a different kind and sort of to really play with those concepts. And there's a lot there in the book because there's, I go into 10 different areas of study from neuroendocrinology, how power affects our bodies and how, you know, affect and the way that people throw energy at you, even if they're not even in the same room with you. Um, how people, if you really pay attention to what people do, and in a sense, like what Annalise talks about, about relational politics, that's exactly, those are the same terms I use, right? Like 
the, the issue is disconnectedness and connectedness is <laughs> the antidote, right? So in everything that we do, right? Not just in terms of how we interact with each other, but how we connect things about seeing how things connect, right? So learning how to flow. And what I learned in, in, in the study of the book is that it's actually really hard to do that, right? Like to what I started to realize about power when I studied it was that when I started to realize the effect that it has on you physically, the kind of practices that people have to go through to learn how to have the kind of discipline, there's actually a discipline, first of all, it's not a right, right? It's a discipline that you live out, right? In your life. And so you live it out in every moment and in every moment where we're interacting with other people, right? Those are the highest leverage points, right? This, these are the kind of things that I have to learn as I said, to put this together. And what it took, especially if you were someone who was positioned as subordinate in a society, um, there's quite a lot to bear in a single interaction, right? But that was, like I said, I have to look at it as like the mode, like the place where everything I did, it was like bringing my spiritual practice to like everyday life, to everything I did, to expanding my sense of opportunities, to like never ultimately realizing that, and someone just posted this online today, someone just posted this quote from my book, which it kind of heartens me when people take things like that and, and, and that it feeds them. And it's this quote about, um, I don't know if I can off the top of my head, but it's about how your attention is the currency with which you purchase your life. So to me, that gets beyond all, no matter what people want to argue about, whether it's oppositional, like the point for me is like, do I even want to be part of that? You know what I mean? Whatever it is, right? Like I listen to what I'm feeling because I realized when I started to practice and learn what it actually takes, like the different facets of power, a, a core facet of it is the energy that we have that we build up, that we spend our life working, that we eat, that we cook. We, we, do, we do a lot in order to build up a reserve of energy that we then use as glucose, right? And so there, even though we can replenish that at any moment in our, in, our, in our life, it is a limited supply. So what we focus our energy on gives us what we want. <laughs> so for me, I started to move beyond, like I just started to pay attention to what drew me and what moved me away. I started to get very elemental. I started to feel things in my body and then theorize from that, right? So I started to use different language and I started to realize that, um, that it's a lot of things about power, but ultimately what I, as a writer now, an editor that people ask you a lot about, well, can we just use the same words and give them different meanings? And then I look back at what I do and I say, well, actually what I notice is that I don't even use the same words. Cause it's almost like you sidestep a paradigm, right? So like the, the, even like the opposition, post-opposition is almost like being caught in paradigms and we're now talking across paradigms, right? <laughs> so like, how do we do that? And I think that's the practice. And it's really amazing because if you really try to connect to the, through the heart, something different happens and it, it's a different language and it opens up a whole different world. So it's really beyond the head. And I think a lot of us in social change are really caught up in a lot of head thinking, head strategy type space. And I've been seeing myself moving more into like heart creative space. It's a lot of not knowing, a lot of dealing with a lot of amazingness and overwhelm from all the talent and amazingness that is there. And then figuring out what are the forms that support this kind of multiplicity as opposed to like these linear agreement focused ways that we have learned to think are the way. Mm. Maybe uh, one more invitation, Cindy, before we bring Tim in. Um, and that is just that, you know, there's so much here, uh, but I think a lot of people's instinctual relationship to power is one of domination, right? You're either, you have it or you don't. You're either right. you know, in charge or you're subjugated. Right. And I think part of speaking for myself, my attraction to your work was you offered us a way, you know, you just talked about sidestepping that paradigm, right? So I think there's a lot of movement in social justice spaces, certainly to move from power over to power with. Um, and I think what's attractive about your work and Anna Luis brings us in too, it's even more than that, right? It's even deeper than that. And there's something about um, the way I kind of translated it in my head was this great line, I believe is in the Game of Thrones that says, um, power resides where we believe it does. And I think um, this will be a bridge to Tim when it's, when it's his turn in just a second, but we actually have power, right? And this is not something we're trying to gain or accumulate out there. It's something that we're sort of trying to unlock or realize within us. And I think this is maybe where we're going with the glucose analogy, but I wonder if you want to say a word about maybe flipping how we understand power for folks who are coming at it with my background and biases of like, oh, there's right. a domination paradigm. So right, I, I jumped right into the middle because there's so much that can be said about this, but I, the, the really initial step 
for me, when I started to write about power, I was differentiating between two types of power, supremacist power and liberatory power. Because when I did research, I realized that it was, even though there was so much on dominant power, that was almost like what everything was, there were these other ways of thinking about power that didn't fit in. And that tied into Vedic scriptures and other types of fields where you expanded the concept across, across just, um, you know, politics, it, it became a, a language of liberatory and that there was this whole way of doing that, that you can actually, that there's already a lot of frameworks and, and things developed ancient practices already on how to live like that. You know, it wasn't like a new thing. It was just like there were these two things and that we had lost a sense that power could be liberatory, that you could actually build it and use it and wield it for good, you know. But, but also, you know, part of what I see and what I think both Annalise and Lorella were saying is that, and I talk about this, this is one of the things that drove me to write my books. I come from the activist community as well, is that I started to see all my activist friends doing the same things that the people we were fighting against were doing. And I was like, well, are we ultimately the same people? And we're just trying to get what our side, is this just like a tribal thing? And then I just started to get really repelled by that. And I thought, no, I think we want to be different types of people. So what types of people would that be, right? And I, and I said, and there was this line, I forget who said this, maybe I said this, because I always try to attribute like some Foucault said this, and I'm like, no, actually I said that. <laughs> but there was this idea that even activists use, no, I think it was Chilla who said it in Methodology of the Oppressed, even activists use the same dominant power strategies. That the activists, by not thinking there was something other than dominant, were just replicating the dominant strategies as opposed to thinking that there was a whole different way of using power. And that's what I differentiated in my book in the first chapter and everything goes from that. So yes, thank you for reminding me of that because yes, power is good, <laughs> but you have to know what type of power you're trying to build. And when you're trying to build liberatory power, it's actually really different. It's based mm -hmm. on, it's based on abundance, <laughs> which is not an easy place to work from. Um, it's based on joy, being happy for others. As a woman of color, I, I sometimes am saddened by the kind of competitiveness that exists in our field. And oftentimes mostly from people that look like just, just like us because we don't have language for talking about how to be around each other and to celebrate and to think that there's enough for everyone. Um, I think that's like my biggest pain nowadays around that because I'm developing work and I see a lot of public stuff and I start dealing with a lot of energy and I see how, how much, pain there is for people of color around knowledge creation. So when you try to create a space, mm -hmm. there's like this knowledge creation, but then there's all this emotion about the fact that people haven't been able to create knowledge. And that's the host of that space. This is this network I've started called edgeleadership.org. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, it's not just thinking work. It's like trauma working through, what does it mean to have your knowledge repressed? You know? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, let's please put a pin in that in your work, your the edge leadership concept, because I think the notion of creating a liberatory space specifically centering people of color feels um, so exciting. It was a theme that came up in, in last year, last week's conversation on aspirational identity. Um, I think this is a good bridge to Tim's work, because I think uh, so. What I found in Tim, and it kind of blew my my mind when I found it, was this concept of um, what Tim calls supplicant politics. And if that's not your coinage, Tim, feel free to give credit where it, where it is due. But the notion that um, sort of as Cindy was just talking about, we inadvertently often reinforce the very paradigms we're trying to transcend, right? This dominant power politics. It resonated for me in the American context. I know you're writing to Australia, but um, this notion that you have power, therefore the way I get power is to go to you and ask for you to give me some of your power. And that is sort of how our politics operates. Um, and you're offering a way out of that, that, uh, that paradigm, which I find super attractive. So could you maybe speak a bit to what that is and how we can get free? <laughs> Yeah, thank you, um, and thank you to to all of you um, who have gone before. There's so much in in what all of you have said, which resonates so deeply with me. Um, you know, if I can pick up on you know the the, the central points of of connection and disconnection, um, and the binary way we see the world um, is is just central, I think, to um, to this challenge. And um, I guess I kind of try to construct this idea of an ecological um, you know, political thinking. It's about reconnecting. It's about understanding interdependence and diversity um, in the way that so many other strains of thought, most particularly, obviously, Indigenous thought, um, has always done. Um, and I think um, 
Yeah, as you were saying, Brian, and, and I picked up very much on Anna Louise, your point about, about second wave feminism kind of almost buttressing, in a sense, patriarchy. I think so much of what we do in social change politics often does the same thing in, in this form of supplicant politics. And I think the reason it does that um, is because is because through the binary way of seeing the world and the dominance-based binary, so it's a separation and a relationship of dominance that we construct there, what we've done is we've constructed the state as a separate entity from us. So instead of government being the people together, governing ourselves, self-governing, um, we've constructed a separate power over us, the Leviathan, as Thomas Hobbes put it, but so many others have put it in, in so many ways. Um, and having done that and working for social change within that structure of having a separate state, it becomes entirely a supplicant politics. So a lot of the time it's, you know, and, and that operates in different ways, depending on the different power relations that we have. It can be a, a supplicant as in asking nicely for change, which, which we so often do. It can be a supplicant politics as, as economic power holders use it as in just buying what they want. Um, and it can be a supplicant politics in terms of demanding as well. And I think we see that so often in a lot of the social movements, the, the more radical social movements still operating within a supplicant politics because they're out on the streets and they're demanding and they're, and they're making noise. And sometimes they're, they're, you know, what, what is termed in the, you know, from power, you know, rioting, um, you know, it's still a supplicant politics because it's still demanding that government change. And I think what we really need to get to, and this is this idea, I think, you know, as I understand it, you know, my, my entry into this idea of post-oppositionality is thinking through, okay, how do, we, how do we dissolve that sense of power? How do we actually, instead of seeking to seize the means of production, how do we actually distribute the means of production? How do we, how do we distribute seeds as the means of production? Um, dissolving supremacist power and creating, cultivating agency for people um, to, to use their own agency in their own lives and construct systems of self-governance. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff in that space, you know, a broad range from, from kind of just, you know, modes of participatory demo democratic practice and deliberative democracy um, through to, you know, Chantal Mouffe's idea of, of agonism as opposed to antagonism through through to anarchist modes um you know and murray bookchin and um and municipal confederalism and, and they share i think all of these ideas share um the basic grounding that what we're trying to do is come together um and i think yeah move really nails i think a really important point about post-oppositionality which is that it's not erasing difference really centrally it's it's actually embracing difference and and argument um but it's doing it in a different way and Lorella I think you you you, you kind of talked to this in a really interesting way as well it's it's a different way of disagreeing which is about trying to find a creative path through um, and that can be a contestation it can be a really vigorous contestation and often you know, you need to, through that contestation, you need to continue to challenge power all the way through and really seek to kind of to, to challenge the entrenched um, power that often happens in, in deliberative democratic spaces, getting white men like me to shut up so that other voices can be heard. Um, and, you know, so many other means of power that are exercised in this space. Um, so yeah, that's that's where I think is is the really interesting space in terms of social change is looking to how we can how we can cultivate from the grassroots up these different ways of disagreeing, these different modes of of being in the world that can get us to a point where we can actually dissolve the the supremacist power. Thank you, Tim. So there's a, there's a lot here. I'm feeling my energy pulled in a few different threads, uh, but want to actually give it back to the room here and see what's alive for you. So the, the floor is open um, if folks want to speak to wherever you're feeling called. You're muted, Cindy, if you're saying something powerful and impassioned. <laughs> 
I just wanted to, something that Tim just said made me think of two main things in terms of relationship to what you're saying. One is, um, you know, I've been writing this piece on personal sovereignty, which is a new concept. And it's a concept that I just kind of like made up and realize it's a, a new concept. And so I ended up connecting with the person who's researching it in Russia. And she sent me her, info, you know, she sent me all this research on it. So I've been really fascinated by the fact that there are actually people studying this. That's, it's actually a thing. It's, um, you know, it devolves from the state to sovereignty at the level of the personal. And so it's a new term that people are getting to use and articulating as a ability to protect your personal space, your psychic space, your body. Um, there are these kind of rights, um, but they're not even rights. They're just kind of like what happens to us, right? And so what they're finding is that when people don't have this, this, they identified six areas that people basically have, feel a need to protect. Like they're, it basically adds up to your identity, right? Um, and you think about the areas, there are the areas in which in society, black people are automatically don't have all of that. That's what it means to be black, right? Is to be at the bottom no matter who else is there, right? And so, and I know people argue that, but that's, that's a stance, <laughs> anti-blackness is real, right? And so, and so, but the research on this doesn't look at race, right? It looks at gender. And um, so it's really, I started to get really fascinated by this concept and studying it because I feel like it's necessary for designing the world we want. The idea that you can have agency and act in the world and have the world respond and see you and acknowledge you and to have all that that comes with personal sovereignty is something that's critical to the work, even though it's not being studied now as part of social change. I'm trying to, the other thing that comes to me, Tim, is that, when if, one of the ways that I've post or anything in terms of binary is, I think is multiplicity. So I'm to this point, it's like, if you want to have a track that just argues, have a track that argues, right? Like, so when I designed an event in New York, I created three tracks and it was like the semiotics track, the, 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 the track for people who wanted to build and the performativity track. And so people could switch modalities and that's how you would design for multiplicity, right? And it's, there's like apparently only three core modalities and, people, and, and then you can see which tracks move faster. <laughs> the semiotics track got into a big argument and like spent a lot of time there. And the performativity track went right to where they want it to be. And they spent the whole time in this different liberatory space, you know what I mean? And so, you know, create options for people. If people want to argue, there's nothing wrong with that. We don't, we don't have to argue about whether we argue or not. <laughs> Just create the joy track or like the, so designing for multiplicity, I find is a way out of that that I've been playing with and that people respond really well to because in my events in New York, people had the option to leave a track and people left tracks. <laughs> so people could see what was generative and what wasn't, you know? Anyway, I just wanted to offer those two things, the personal and sort of like the designing for multiplicity. Can I, can I say something that kind of builds on all of this and also addresses the question that Joan just, June just, sorry, June just put in. Um, I think one of the things that could be really useful for us as we do this work or as we like work to make the world better is the concept of intellectual humility. And I know it's a really tricky one, especially for people who come from subjugated groups because it's important to have pride in our thought and confidence in what we say. But as humans, I think we tend to just in general have so much hubris, like we can know, we can know the truth, we have the answers, and we're looking for the answer, and we want certainty, and all of these things trap us, right? They slow us down, they, may, they lead into the right and wrong, um, you've got it or you don't, and they make it harder to make mistakes. So I think intellectual humility, as much as we can embrace the idea that we are learning. So how do we learn all the skills, I think was the question in the chat. We just do our best and we just start somewhere and we just keep working from there. And I think that helps us to build that personal sovereignty. I think we're actually working with our own chi then, I, you know, kind of thinking of kind of what Cindy was saying a little bit. Um, so I think that's like can be really useful. It can be a way to start to break out of right and wrong and acknowledge we'll make mistakes. And if we can all have the humility to say, yeah, we'll make mistakes, that's okay. You know, I mean, granted, there's scope there, right? Like I understand some mistakes could be huge and like kill somebody. Like, I don't mean like that, but just like as we're living our lives and as we're having these ideas and teaching and doing our work. Secondly, um, I think that in general in Western cultures, we're trained to think of difference as deviate, as, 
as deviation. There's the norm and there's the deviation. And so difference is always lesser. And Audre Lorde just does such a beautiful job of breaking this down in a few of her essays in Sister Outsider. It's just like, it, she just, it's just so clear when you see it there. So if we can think of difference relationally, right? Then that becomes a way to have these conversations and it's not right or wrong or better or worse. So that's a way to do it in that space of abundance. And then also thinking about commonality rather than sameness and difference. Like when we look for what we have in common, well, everyone needs enough food to eat. So it's not that right or wrong or left or right or things like that, but what are those spaces where we have something in common, not the same? And how can we use those places of commonality, reminding us that it's not about being the same, it's just about some kind of shared space. Then that can be part, I think, of how maybe we can build different conversations and stuff. I wanted to, um, take us back to power for, for a second, because, you know, at the core of all organizing, right. As is, is this belief, uh, that people have the agency to transform the laws, the policies, the institutions that govern their lives and really believe that people power can, that, that people can wield power, can build and then wield power. And, you know, I think a lot about and have been influenced in my own thinking uh, and training about Hannah Arendt and her sort of understanding and definitions of power, right? Power as uh, not something that can be relied upon at all times, but as something that is actually available to us and available to people. Uh, and uh, you write this like notion of power in the public sphere right through actions and language. Uh, and when I ground in my own experience, in my experience um, playing a role in helping to build the immigrant youth movement here, uh, you know, I remember the first time I heard someone say undocumented and unafraid, and I was so confused and so taken aback by why someone would choose to say that. <laughs> And some people added unapologetic at the end of that. Um, and that sort of confusion, you know, sort of evaporated quickly because when you find yourself in space with people who are not just, um, who do not only believe in their power, but are ready to contend for power uh, and believe that, that they, if they, that if, if we, if more people could join our fight, right, this is sort of part of like mass struggle and social movements that we can, we could wield power. Um, so, so as I found my agency and I claimed my power, it, be, it became so clear to me that our movements have to be carried by people who don't have the luxury of setting it down or walking away from the struggle. And just to make our conversation even more grounded in the present and in what we're going through right now, I mean, think about this past year, right? This past year has required all of our resilience and our all of our commitment to not set it down, right? On top of the daily violence to our communities and our democracy uh, from the Trump administration, we've also been we, as in communities of color, especially hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. And even so we stayed standing, right? And we took to the streets this summer to demand justice for black people killed by police and, um, and millions of people led by the movement for black lives then joined in solidarity across the country in a historic mass uprising for racial justice. And so the reason why I'm bringing that in, bringing that into the space is because there is something to be said about, actually there's everything to be said about people's ability to build and wield power, to change individual individuals first and then move into the collective, right? To like turn individual and personal grievance into collective grievance. Uh, and, um, and that, you know, I'm like also um, reflecting on that a little bit because I'm originally Peruvian. I moved here when I was 10 and I'd also always grown up with sort of this sense of um, a lot of sadness around the state of Peru and its politics and, you know, how people relate to their government. 
um, and how disillusioned people have become generation after generation with their government. And what we saw this week, this over the last two weeks, especially happen in Peru was a real shift away from sort of giving away one's power to taking it very directly, right? Like, like 10 days ago, I was so depressed about what was happening in Peru, right? The Congress decided to basically impeach the president, to vacate the president. And the president of, of the parliament essentially became the president of Peru. No democratic process in violation of the constitution, et cetera, right? The story goes on. And most people, I think, would have settled, but young people in Peru, sort of the, the younger generations in Peru said, you know, we're going to take it to the streets. <laughs> and if not for their actions and their courage and sort of this collective grievance and demand and mobilizations from coast to coast in Peru, right, we would be stuck with this person who has no authority, no reason to be president. Um, and all of that shifted, like that power dynamic in Peru, sort of from like government does whatever it wants, whenever it wants, to actually government is accountable to the people, happened in a matter of 10 to 14 days, right? So it's just a reminder of, even as we get into the theory and, uh, and sort of this conversation to still like come back and ground in the moments that we are living through, not just in the United States and like places like Peru and other parts of the world where people keep on contesting for power, the belief that a different future is not only possible, but necessary, right? And they move into action to make that the truth. <laughs> um, so there's just this question of like, how do we sustain it? And how do we close the gap between vision Right? How do we close the gap between vision and where we are right now? Right, Understanding that there is no single answer to that question, that there is no single strategy, no single play, no cure-all omnibus legislation or savior elected official. Uh, but in fact, the answer is in ourselves and in our movement. Um, and that we, it requires a theory of change that is multifaceted, right? That is thinking about the different dimensions of power, narrative power, people power, electoral power, et cetera, right? Um, yeah. If I can pick up on a couple of those um, issues through there and get so, so much to pick up on, so, so many wonderful thoughts. I think one of the ways that we that we move from here to there is is by moving from from movements which have for such important good reason arisen from collective grievance to collective construction um and how do we how do we make that kind of how do we make that kind of shift and i think you're spot on lorella and and also both cindy and anna louise you, you talked about this through in different ways about the designing for multiplicity um that's that's where my my big dispute with I'm sure you've all read Murray Bookchin and you know social ecology and the idea of, of democratic confederalism he kind of talks about uh, a new a new kind of non-state governing formation built from um, from communities self-governing and then a confederation of those communities self-governing what he does in that though is that he is he puts all decision making into this one system of um, of municipal um, self-governance and I think yeah the 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 point that you made Cindy in terms of designing for multiplicity and I think what's really exciting about this idea of how we how we move to collective construction is really dramatically expanding the idea of democracy dramatically expanding the democratic space into you know um Cooperatives, for instance, cooperativism in in the workspace is is also a democratic formation. You know, communities coming together to do some urban farming, which we've got a lot of happening in Canberra. Um, you know, quite recently over the last couple of years, expanded dramatically. Urban farming is a democratic space. Um, it's it's reclaiming our right to to cultivate ourselves, um, which is a central way of kind of reclaiming power. Um, and agency in our own lives. Um, and I think by doing that, that democratic practice is central to answering that question, how do we learn? How do we learn the skills? Well, we learn by doing, as you said, Anna Louise, that's such an important point. 
But I also wanted to make the point that there actually are, and I'm sure uh, you guys, but also you know many folks on the on the live stream are very aware. There are so many techniques for facilitation that are so important that we learn because I'm sure we've all been in spaces that have been supposedly participatory deliberative spaces, which really haven't been. They haven't been because they haven't been well facilitated. They haven't been because the people taking part haven't been willing to challenge power within those spaces and haven't been willing to actually open it up so that every voice is heard you know whether it's whether it's you know asset based community development kind of facilitation or whether it's you know th there's so many different um skill sets in facilitation and i think one of the critical critical paths actually for us to follow is to is to learn those skills ourselves and to and to ensure that as many people as possible are trained in facilitation so that we can make all those um multiple democratic spaces work as well as possible. I want to offer, um, I mean, there's there's so much here, so I want to offer one one uh, thread and then feel free to pick it up or, or pick something else up. Um, Cindy talked earlier about uh, heart space and feeling drawn into, uh, I think the thing that is alive for me in this conversation and maybe for folks out there is like, what does this feel like? I mean, I'm, I'm appreciative that Lorella brought in, you know, Peruvian youth right now, like, what is the embodied experience of being in a collective movement that is predicated or based on principles of abundance or joy? And I'm thinking of that viral video that went around here in the US during elections of the Philadelphia folks dancing and how like contagious and attractive it is, right? Like if we are, if you believe in the science of co-regulation, right? That we actually react to each other's embodied presence, right? It's power is, is affective. Um, something that struck me last fall watching the wave of protests roll across the world, right, you know, in Lebanon and Chile and um, is how joyful they were, right? Like you see their faces, you know, the woman, this sort of iconic image of the woman in Sudan, right? Like it's emphatic, it's declarative and it's powerful and it's attractive, right? It's like, I am here and I am not. So I just wondered, I don't know if, you know, who to pitch this question to, but the, um, what does it feel like? And, and how do we know, right? How do we give people an experience, an embodied experience of being part of a movement that is not like other things that have been offered to us, right? These, you know, the dominant institutions we're in, you know, parenting, churches, you know, the government, corporations, right? Like most of our experiences are not in these liberatory spaces. What does it feel like? Uh, <laughs> I, would love to, I would love to get at that because I feel like I'm in the throes of that right now with launching the Edge Leadership Platform, which is this platform that started off as a space for leaders of color, like an RNG for liberatory space, right? And it's gotten a lot of attention and funding and all this. It, it, it's like people like, I mean, it's just been amazing. It's like propelled. It's like something that really wants to happen. And people show up to the space and they show up with the same stuff, they drag it all in, right? And so a lot of what we're doing is fit. And, I, and, then, and then we don't wanna be like policing because we don't wanna be sucked into the, a role, right? So we're like, so in everything that we do, we have to figure out how do we keep like putting forward what we want, putting forward as the host of the space, as the curators, right? Like even how we curate, like no matter how much you say, this is a space for this, 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 this and this, People show up because they're drawn to that, but most people have no idea what it is. <laughs> it's like bumper cars, right? And, and it's like, if you're hosting that space, it's not a collective hosting facilitation experience. I have been seeing it as a curatory experience where I have to protect that intention. And so then it's not collective and people show up with the assumptions that like, if it's not collective, it's bad, right? And I'm like, no, this is a special invitation this is curated space. We're not gonna design from our pain. We're gonna design for what, for like what we want from our desires. And almost, it, it's just very hard. It's, it's very hard. And it's, it's like, it's not hard to people are drawn to it. So that makes it easy, but it's like learning a whole new way of being. It's very hard for people to do that in the spaces. People are drawn to those spaces like moths and flame and they bring all their stuff. <laughs> So it's just, I've just been having a lot of fun with it um, because I'm also, as I'm curating it, trying to not fall into a binary of doing all the things that people would expect someone to do when people aren't doing what you're asking them to do or what you're opening up the space for them to do, right? People need 
we have to create these steps for people to learn how to be liberatory, right? It's like people, you know what I mean? Like it's like rush to something and then you like fall, you know? So th that's the experience I'm having. Um, and every once in a while, you'll find someone that that's, that does flow. It feels like flow when it's not like that. And I have a lot of that as well. And that's what I pay attention to. Um, but I'm starting to pay attention to different things in people, not what people say, you know? Um, like I've had women use, you know, relate to me and say sister, sister, but they still use the same dynamics, right? That I, and I feel the pain of the, of the, so I, I'm just really paying attention to how, what people do and whether, um, whether it makes me feel um, jabbed at or seen and appreciated, you know? And it's a spiritual practice to see the light in others. So about myself, it's the same thing. <laughs> It's the hardest thing. I'm like, please, God, help me. But, you know, more and more, that's what I orient towards, right? And so I'm looking for someone that orients. So then my rules are not to struggle with people. It's to, like, see who I vibe with, right? I'm trying to find those people and trying to avoid the people that come at me, you know? And sometimes the words don't say it, but it's the feeling. You feel it. Because once you start feeling, like, you become like an antenna. And you have to protect yourself, too, you know? Because it's been hard. I mean, I had a lot of reactions physically to this at the beginning when I was learning and I have a spiritual practice to support it, but that's what it feels like. Mm. I have two thoughts that come to mind. One is like people, if you just, you, we just have to follow people's leadership, <laughs> meaning like, I really feel like there is a difference between how most national leaders show up and how most like state leaders and like local leaders show up, you know? Like in a way we almost become so stiff and serious in the national sphere. And like a lot of, a lot of our partner organizations embody joy and lead with joy. Like I'm thinking of make the road, New York right now. Like every time I go, I've gone to their office in Queens, um, there's just so much joy and there's so much life. And uh, some people are learning and some people are making food and some people are dancing. And so people know how to do this. Um, and so that's one, I think the second is we have been, you know, I'm struck by some of the stuff that you're saying, Cindy, because so many of us in organizings really were trained by the Alinsky model. Right. And I often feel like the Alinsky models actually, and I have found, I found it to be very effective when I was doing on the ground organizing and in my own sort of coming out and sort of thinking about story of self as really identifying a hard choice point uh, that meant like tapping into the pain and the power of tapping into the pain in order to get people to take action. Like, so you have to almost like go into and experience that pain for a second and then believe that another world is possible um, so that's, that's one sort of, uh, like, what do we do with that? What do we make of that? Um, and I wanted to lift up Alicia Garza's, Garza's book, The Purpose of Power is sort of like a black feminist take on organizing, uh, you know, much more joyful, um, sort of take on movement building and movements as like our present movements of, as movements that just pick up where previous movements left off, but not really as a, a new thing that we are creating, but more as the evolution of, you know, or like the next phase of uh, the people who have come before us. So just wanted to offer that up. Um, and I'm, you know, and I'm not, how, how do we move? Like, is there value in actually struggling through the thing? Is there value in tapping into the pain um, I, but I also get your point of actually, I want to, I want to tap into like designing for our desires or from our desires, as opposed to from the struggle and the pain. Um, but I, 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 I sit with it. I'm sitting with it. I'm okay. oh, sorry. You go. Anna. Oh, are you sure? Okay. Um, so I'm mainly a theorist and a teacher, but one of the things that I teach is yoga. Um, I started teaching yoga as a way to stop living so much in my mind and actually occupy my body, which is a challenge if you're like somebody who loves to read and just like disassociate. And I, you know, coming back to the question of the heart, well, the heart is actually part of the body. 
So I just wonder how, if there's ways to help people um, cultivate a sense of embodiment that, that, that can then connect with intuition, that then can provide that joy to be in a curated space and maybe foster a different kind of self-trust or different kind of power, or maybe can that sometimes be a point of like insight? Can I speak to that? Because can you hear me? So that's exactly what I noticed when we did the event in New York, that the track that did the performativity, which came, which actually, so, you know, a lot of that exists in theater. And um, I write about theater a lot in my book because I discovered it through my daughter, who's actually in her senior year um, of college, and she's a theater person. And so through having her and taking, I've learned so much that is embodied aspects of power are already existing in the theater world. And a lot of the practices for masterful acting is to be able to switch status. So you have to learn how to, <laughs> how to embody a lower status person and how to embody a higher status person. And the assumption is that a master is someone who can switch back and forth depending on the condition and the context. So um, that learning to switch status is actually the goal, not learning to always have high status. So I found that fascinating. And, and I have found that in my work, people are really thirsty for embodied ways of going at it. Um, Theater offers a lot of that with theater power status games. I have tons of books. I just, actually, that's like the next thing um, that I want to get into because there's so many that I feel like and when I talk to the people that my daughter works with, her professors, um, who are like, you know, because she's in school in Connecticut, close to Broadway, right? A lot of people coming from New York to teach. Um, there are people who are using these exercises. And in the theater world, when I pay attention to the creative process as opposed to like the strategic process, in the theater world, you don't start even working together. They spend the first two weeks just connecting, just vibing together. They do all these physical acts. So they don't even start rehearsing till the two weeks of the building the, the, the group. So they intentionally begin by creating an a group from the people to embodying a group, you know? And then everything they do throughout is embodied. So I am just constantly in awe and trying to bring that into the space and when I do, and when I like the events in New York, it was the performativity space held so much energy. Everyone said, it was like the space that only the brave people would go to. And then people would say afterwards, I really wanted to go there. You guys looked like you were having so much fun. But it was so scary. The idea of just becoming someone different. And then the people that came, some of them would say, I had to come, you guys were having so much fun. And then they would just, be, they, I, I thought it was really hard, but it's really not that hard. And when you would just, when you would just put people in these like, situations that were like games they were just act differently you know i mean this is like people from like foundation you know people from the ford foundation like program officers people that aren't used to playing with power this way and people would perform like we had this exercise that like three people in, a, in like what sit stand kneel and you had to switch according to your status and attention would have to be responded to and embodied and they would resolve situations so quickly when they were forced to be embodied and everyone was shocked. <laughs> so I just really uh, uh, want to second that. And I've been playing with that and I would love for us to do that more as a field. Um, it's great fun also. And when you play games with somebody, no matter what you do, even if you compete, you entrain with them. You actually end up liking them just from playing games with someone. There's a there's a great theatre sports game that that kind of goes to that of you know switching from you know from from no but to yes and, and yes always yes. you've got to always accept and then move accept exactly. and move um, and it's the same you know so I'm a musician I've done a bit of theatre but I'm a musician and it's the same with improvising the idea of improvisation is entirely linked with listening you you can't improvise unless you're really 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 closely listening to everybody around you and looking it's it's the it's the eye contact and it's the audio contact and you start to feel it and you, you feel it embodied um and yeah i i think that, that embodiment that anna louise that, that that you talk about as well and that and brian you talked about kind of the the almost the electromagnetic impulses that that kind of go on and there's this wonderful book i don't know if it's come to america at all yet um tyson Yunker porter is um an australian aboriginal man Sand Talk is, is his book about how Indigenous thinking can, 
can save the world. And he talks a lot about how, if you think about the evolution of laughter, for instance, it is, it is, it is purely um, that interconnection between people. And it's, it's, the, it's the human embodiment of, of, a, of a point of interconnection between people that kind of springs out unbidden in us. Um, and yeah, I think that's one of the, you know, we've all, everyone's talked about kind of that, the joy that comes with these things. You know, one of my reflections is, is participating in and, and helping to facilitate various participatory and deliberative democratic spaces. Um, and particularly when you think about them in spaces which are really contested. And one of the, one of the intensely contested spaces in Australia is, is fossil fuels um, versus clean energy and um, and particularly in certain communities which have been for a long time reliant on fossil fuels. Um, there's an incredible division in those communities. And it's really fascinating when you, when you come into a room and you've got people who are just, you know, arms crossed, glaring at each other, people who often haven't spoken to each other in months or years. And you open up a space where you're, you're asking people to come into a space together and very deliberately not asking people to pick sides. So that goes back to that earlier conversation that we were having. Um, our politics is based on asking people to pick sides and fight. You know, the adversarialism that's so inherent in our politics is all about that. Um, if you go into a space and you bring people together and you start by talking about, okay, well, we, we have a common challenge here and we have, um, we have a common community and a common future. And let's start by imagining, um, it, well, let's start by talking about what, what the strengths are in our community, like an ABCD, an asset-based community development kind of approach. What have, we, what have we got here that's so great? And then share experiences from elsewhere, from other communities that are going through the same kind of challenges and kind of, and you draw people together and then you start, only then do you start asking people to actually imagine what might come next. And the shift in, in, in the, bot, the embodiment of it from the crossed arms to the writing and thinking and kind of often, you know, looking down and introspection to opening up that happens often over the course of half an hour in those kinds of spaces. And then you get to the point at the end where people are smiling and people are laughing and people want to come back and they want to do it again. Um, it doesn't always work, obviously, but that physical transformation that goes on in those spaces when they work so well is just astonishing to watch. And that, that to me is just that, that literal embodiment of, of post-oppositionality. Tim is uh, starting to take us into our, our final prompt here. Um, which is just a, an invitation to each of you, and we'll do maybe a minute or two a piece, just to offer a practice. So we've talked about embodiment, we've talked about the empower and importance of holding space, uh, a feeling of you know taking action. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, speaking for myself, and I think Cindy brought this in at the beginning, just super hard. I think we're intellectually there. People want to do this. We want to be together differently. We're just not, you know, a liberatory space that Cindy's holding. It's like, sounds great in theory. How, how do I do it? <laughs> So uh, an invitation here maybe is to go around and share if there's something that you have found helpful in your own personal work, something that people can take away from this call to start working on right now um, in their lives, social presence in theater, whatever, whatever it is that works for you. So uh, we'll start with Cindy, and then we'll go uh, Anna Louise, Tim, and Lorela, and then we'll, we'll close. Yeah, that's great questions. I love practice. Um, I think for me, it's... Uh, really paying attention and orienting towards what I want, like always. Um, it's a constant practice. And I've, something that I've learned recently that I find is helpful for me is that, you know, we are embodied beings, so we do experience things. And, you know, there's a, a commitment for me to be like radically responsible for what I experience. And <laughs> hopefully other people will be radically responsible for their own experience because we create our own experience. Um, but I feel that, you know, what I, I've learned that emotions have to be ridden through kind of like your body has to release them. Right. So I've had a lot of people talking to me and I've been trying to figure out how to deal with people who are having a lot of anxiety and oftentimes we want to stop it, solve it or whatever. And I was just kind of like, Oh, I don't need to do anything. I just, this person just needs to ride out their feeling 
And as soon as I was able to like understand that, it just made me understand like a really simple thing that I feel like we should all understand. And maybe everyone does it. It was just me, but yeah, I mean, I'm a mom. I have two kids. I have a daughter in college. You know, it's just like how how do we be human by like allowing our emotions, being responsible for them, and allowing each other to ride them through? You know. Yeah. That's it. So, mine goes back to actually how you opened, Brian, and it's like so simple, <laughs> but breath. Right. I mean, this whole year is inviting us to appreciate our ability to breathe. If you think about what COVID impacts, I um, have to just give a shout out to astrology because I think it can be really important and useful. And we have the grand conjunction coming up and the shift into air as an element that we're all going to be experiencing for the next several hundred years. That's a long backstory. Um, but anyways, I think taking the time to breathe intentionally rather than reacting to what we hear is really a useful way to at least put a pause on the oppositionality. It can be really useful to dialing back anxiety, even something so simple as breathing in and counting like three and then breathing out and counting to four. So changing our breath a little bit so that the exhale is a little bit longer um, can be really a useful way to kind of calm ourselves down take a space and listen a little more intentionally. That's mine. Love it. Yeah. And I think defining this year about breathing is, is so, so clear as well in terms of obviously the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and from an Australian perspective, we started the year with our East Coast completely blanketed in thick smoke. Um, and it was literally impossible to breathe outside air conditioned spaces for, in my city of Canberra, like two months. Um, so the breath is, is so important. Um, one of the practices that's kind of related to that breath that I've found really beautiful as well um, is bringing people into, through, through breath and through that kind of moment of grounding, um, bringing people into an understanding of our interdependence. Um, that, you know, through the breath, you can, you can feel the breath of the others around you and you can, you can appreciate how our bodies are not, um, are not independent. Abs this, the idea of, of, of the human body as being an independent organism is simply utterly wrong. Um, we're completely interdependent. Our bodies are an ecosystem and they're an open, complex, adaptive ecosystem that is dependent on everything that comes into them and goes out of them. Um, and that overlaps with everybody else's body. And so using that practice of breath to really deeply think into our interdependence, um, I think is, is one of the most powerful things we can do. Mm. So much good stuff. I love all these practices. Um, so there are two things I do a lot. Uh, one is I work out every day. <laughs> um, and I think of um, fitness, not just as the physical, but uh, actually as a, is something that is very powerful in my life, uh, both in pushing my, uh, my, sort of, it changes my, my whole state. Uh, I'm also an adaptive, uh, athlete. So I have an above the knee amputation and, uh, engaging in physical activity or in fitness every day, uh, is, is a constant way of pushing the perceived limitations. Like I, you know, you grow up in a society that tells you, you cannot do many things. Um, and it's not about proving it to myself. It's just about living the kind of life I've always imagined for myself. That's one. And I think two is, uh, reading, um, like always making the time for a little reading and a little reflection. And I, you know, I carry this notebook, uh, and now I'm trying to put more into Evernote because I'm often <laughs> trying to look at my notebooks and I can't find the exact thing that I'm looking for uh, or I switch notebooks, but you know, I, I think it's so important to make time, um, for ourselves just a little bit, like even if it's 30 minutes or 60 minutes, which sometimes feels indulgent, 
right? When you're moving meeting to meeting and where everything feels urgent. Uh, but what are, what, how to, how to give each other, uh, and ourselves enough grace to show up in this world, uh, and permission to be, uh, and to take care of ourselves. Um, you know, I'm not always great at it, but I try. Uh, thank you. I was afraid Lorella was going to remind us that we are not engaged in physical activity daily, uh, but it's an aspiration that I hold for myself. So thank you for bringing that back. Chasing my kids around usually gets it. Um, yeah, there's a lot here. I think um, a couple thoughts on next steps, and then and then I'll do a closing invitation. And June, if you want to come back on video, welcome to join us back here to Zoom. Thank you for for bringing folks in from YouTube. Um, so two thoughts on next steps. Uh, so June and I had a chance to talk last week, and one of the ideas that we want to experiment with in building belonging is how to create space to take this conversation, which just happened in the Zoom room, and then is connected through the magic of the internet to the YouTube room into a shared space of, of questioning and inquiry. And so we're gonna try an experiment next week, um, co-hosted by June and this, uh, a colleague of mine named Sarah Wang, who's based in the Netherlands. And we couldn't join today's call because time zones are tyrannical. Um, to explore this, just to basically say, hey, let's get together in small groups. Whoever shows up will show up. We'll have three or 10 or 50 people and uh, we'll just go into what this is bringing out for folks. So that's an invitation. Um, we'll drop that in the chat here in a second. Um, and folks who are on this call are obviously encouraged and welcome to join. Tim probably won't work out for you time zone wise, but we'll uh, do our best to represent your voice. Um, the second thing is we'll be having more of these conversations. I think a lot of the questions that were bubbling both here in this room and then on the live stream around, sounds great. How do we do this, right? <laughs> so stuff's hard. Um, and so the, the conversations on transformation are kind of conceived as these are the collective skill set we need to work towards. Never, never going to get there, but we need to figure out how to bridge across difference. We need to figure out how to self-regulate our emotions and sort of tune into our own bodily presence. We need to figure out how to right connect, um, you know, networks, network weaving around different. So these are a way to offer some of the folks who are doing this. And I think that the, the question I want to step into here as a as an invitation to close is. Uh, so at some level, like part of my attraction to these spaces is I think all of you in your own ways have set a high watermark around a concept, you know, supplicant politics, post-oppositionality power. And so my great desire is to do what Lorella described for these social movements is um, start from where you've got to. <laughs> let's not reinvent it. Let's get as far as we've got. And then uh, if Alicia has got the, got the torch, let's join her. Um, What's next? What do we not yet know? So a closing invitation here is just, what is a question or inquiry that's alive for you? It could be an embodied feeling if, if you wanna go there. Um, coming out of this conversation that you're sitting with, Lorella expressed some, some questioning around uh, holding this tension of, uh, I forget how we put it earlier, I'm looking at my notes here, but um, that's something we're still sitting with. What else are you sitting with right now? So we will do, uh, Actually, I'm going to put June on the spot uh, and invite June to speak first. What's a, an inquiry that's alive for you? And then we'll do a, a Lorella, Tim, and Elise, and Cindy to close. June, what's an inquiry that's alive? Well, you know, I was, I'm just really fascinated by uh, what Tim kind of alluded to this, this neat, you know, how do we create? You know, how do we co-create and begin to pull ourselves together to co-create this world that's good for all of us? And, you know, this concept of self-organizing, you know, I just starting to think that I use a lot about, you know, people coming together, seeing something they, they want to experiment with and try and learning from that, sharing what they're learning. And I'm, I'm really sitting with, okay, now how does that fit with everything I heard uh, tonight? So uh, I'm really looking forward to you know, spending some time thinking more about that. Mm. I feel like there's a lot to explore and um, do deeper dives into, but I think Cindy, you were the one who talked about self-sovereignty. Uh, and my question and sort of future inquiry and curious, I'm curious about what that means in a world that is fundamentally unsafe for different kinds of people a world that isn't safe if you are trans, it's not safe if you're black, it's often not safe if you are disabled. And so um, not you know what I mean? Not, so like, how do you, what does that mean in the context of like people's current lived experience
Do you want me to answer that, or is that like a question? Out there? I wasn't sure. <laughs> I think none of these are answerable, but we'll, we'll okay. hold the question. Uh, then we'll come back, Cindy. But I think Tim, and then uh, Anna Weiss, and then Cindy, you'll get to go last. Um, I think related to that point of how do we do it when a lot of us are not safe. Um, the yeah, the huge challenge I think that that I'm grappling with, you know, in my thinking is, you know, when you're talking about these self-organizing systems as Danella Meadows talks about it, or, or you know, what, what Piotr Kropotkin called the instinct for mutual aid, you know, these, you know, these ideas are, are old, old ideas that we've been sitting with for a long time. And they tend, they tend to work and they tend to grow beautifully and start to flourish. And then the people who hold power stamp on them. And we're living at a we're living at a point in history when authoritarianism is rising like we haven't seen for um, most of our lifetimes, um, which is a yeah, which is an extraordinarily oppositional and confrontational politics, um, as oppositional and confrontational as it gets. Um, and I I deeply believe that we can we can dissolve that by kind of creating from from the grassroots from below but yeah when you put it in the context of that rising authoritarianism um and the danger the fear, very physical danger to many 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 of us um yeah it's scary and hard so i was gonna say something like, what does it mean? What does it look like to think and act from the heart? But then after what Tim said, I was thinking about what Lorella said early on when she brought in Frederick Douglass and his narrative. And there's this place in his narrative where he talks about a friend who gives him a root, right? And he kind of dismisses it, but he puts it in his pocket. And that root then helps him to kind of like rebel against the slaveholder. And so hi, the root is High John the Conqueror. Right, so it actually goes with um, a whole spiritual tradition. So I guess part of my question is, how can we bring in spiritual and psychic forces as part of making the change? And again, I know that might be a little bit out there, but there's a long strand of that when we look at social movements and how spirit comes into it. I definitely second the spirit. The spirit is more expansive <laughs> than you know, these forms. Um, I think for me, the, the thing that I've been, that stands out for me as, I, as we close is the question, I guess, that was posed in Hart and Negri's latest book, Assembly, where they say that the challenge to the social um, change person in this time is the new form, the new structure. And he talks about how the people are more advanced than the leaders, which I totally believe. <laughs> and that the connectivity that's available between people has actually created a lot of um, different types of energy that hasn't been organized yet for, for what we want, right? Even with algorithms, like, does it talk a lot about all this stuff? But I, to me, the, the central, the simple way of capturing that is what are the new forms that are needed, right? I think people, you know, at least for me at MPQ, I often, the very practical part of all of this is people calling me saying, is there a model for this, 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 and that? And all the things that people are asking for, I don't think currently exist, at least not in an easily accessible, knowable place. And so I've been thinking a lot about how people are asking for similar types of new things and those things, you know, so that's why I created the space, the Exhibition space to do this kind of work. But that has been my driving question. And I don't think that we're gonna need a gazillion forms. It'll probably be like a multiplicity, but what are the core forms people are asking for forms that are alternatives to hierarchy that's a big one you know to you know all these oppositionality like what the, what are the new forms what are the things that people can play with um so that's what how, how that becomes really concrete for me but definitely infused by spirit and i always look at what nature does mm. thank you yeah and thank you all and thanks for there's so much here i think you're here uh Pointing to a future conversation, Cindy, well, several here, but um, one that we've got planned is around for that question around how we do self, what does self organizing structure look like? And I also uh, invite you, we're also doing a, a session on forms, and I'll let you know if you can share it with the person who wrote the book on forms. So we're having a discussion on edge about forms as a please, yeah, so yeah, so I'll much you know. hunger for learning here. Yeah. 
Um, Lorela dropped. Uh, she has another call at this uh, at seven, which is East Coast time, where, where she is right now. And we want to honor folks' commitments both here in the Zoom room and to those who joined us live. So, um, thank you to those who are out there in the interwebs, wherever you may be. Um, I'm going to stop the live stream here.